morning, we are going to discuss epispadias and hypospadias, as well as cataracts in childhood. Epispadias and hypospadias are malformations of the penis, in which the urethral opening occur in the upper or downside of the penis. So if it occurs on the upper side, it's epispadias, and on the downside, it is hypospadias. And cataract is a clouding or the opacity of the lens that leads to a regular painless blurring of vision and eventually leads to blindness. This session will discuss these three topics. And by the end of the session, students should be able to define epispadias, hypospadias, and cataracts enumerate the etiology and of epispadias, hypospadias, and cataracts, and describe the clinical manifestations of epispadias, hypospadias, and cataracts, and then their management. So as you can see, these three main topics are what we're discussing. And we can read this from chapters 20, 19 and 27. So for the first topic, we'll look at hypospadias and epispadias. So hypospadias is a congenital condition in which the urethral meatus is not on the tip of the penis, but on the ventral aspect, that is the under surface of the penis or the shaft of the penis or anywhere between the uh, shaft of the penis between the perineum to the tip of the glands of the penis. So instead of the tip, the opening ranges from anywhere beneath the glands penis down to the perineum. So it says the location of the urethral meatus on the ventral aspect that gives it this definition. So there are variations between, uh, ranging between mild to severe. And sometimes in severe cases, this will result in the opening of the urethral meatus, even on the scrotum. And also another variation we may have is cordy. And this is a cord-like anomaly where the scrotum a cord, a cord like anomaly that extends from the scrotum to the penis, causing the penis to arc or bend downwards. So, when this happens, urination is not a problem, but the male child cannot urinate in the normal position that all males do. Hypospadias often occur in conduction with congenital cordy. So it is important to mention this under hypospadias. And then also epispadias is the congenital anomaly where the urethral mesis opens on the dorsal surface of the penile shaft. And here you also have variations extending from small opening or a fissure that extends along the side of the penis. And epispadias also occur in conjunction with bladder estrophy. And bladder estrophy then becomes a mild form of epispadias. So by way of pathophysiology, this usually occurs or happens from failure of the urethra, urethra fold to fuse completely over the urethral groove. So when there is a fissure, this happens. And then the incidence is that hypospadias is more common than epispadias. Diagnosis. This is made at best on initial examination. Hence the importance, once again, of examination of the newborn. And also in advanced settings, diagnosis can be made prenatally through ultrasound. So it's not about having the ultrasound done, but the personnel 
being qualified to be able to detect this prenatally. Treatment. The infant cannot be circumcised because the foreskin is needed for the repair. Surgical correction is done between 6 to 18 months of life to minimize psychological effects on bo of body image and castration anxiety. The goal of surgical repair is to replace the urethral meatus in such, in such a way that the child can void in a standing position. And the release of cordy to straighten the penis to enable future sexual function. And also in severe hypospadias may require additional surgical procedures later in life. And also it is important to address clients' concerns at birth because the parents once again will be traumatized. Pre-operative teaching to relieve the anxiety and about the future appearance and also the success of the surgery is very, very important. Post-operative care, protecting the surgical site from injury. From surgery, the penis is wrapped in a simple dressing and also which allows the child to void in a normal way and also fresh blood may be seen post-operatively because of the nature of the surgery. And then our objective here is to avoid removal of the stent and then using immobilization to prevent this removal of the stent and also injury caused by the child to himself. The objective of care is to encourage fluid intake and maintain adequate urine output and patency of the stent. Starting with clear fluids progressing is mild to uh, breast milk as the child can tolerate. So once again, just as we do in normal surgery uh, of the adults, uh, what we give we build on from clear fluids to half strength to full strength. But if it is breast milk, then when we are building on is breast milk that is given. And then early documentation of fluid intake by way of strict input and output and also the urine drainage is very, very indicative looking at the color, the absence or presence of blood and any discoloration and the smell, all this is noted, the flow of the urine, all these need to be documented. And then pain control is also very, very important. If we don't stay on top of the pain, uh, there is the need, uh, the likelihood that the child will not void as a result of pain. So it's very, very important that we give adequate pain and also uh, antibiotics in this case. Discharge teaching. There is also very, very important that we teach the parents about the nature of the surgery and the need to protect the stents and also increase fluid intake. So we must make sure that all this is well done so that they don't come back with more severe complications. And also it's very, very important that in our setting, we make sure that if patients can afford it and patient's condition allows it, we should make sure that the patient is fully recovered to the extent that they can take care of the child at home and maintain the stent in position and protect it from dislodging. Because if not, then this will affect the surgery success. Discharge teaching, we have to, the child's activity must be limited for the first two weeks. So it means that it's important that we keep the child in hospital till all these phase wears off. And here, the child is still in pain and because of the probability of dislodging the stent, it's also important that we do top and tail in bathing and note that the urine, note that urine will be blood stained for several days. So we have to educate the mothers on this and then the control of pain. Once again, this can affect the feeding, even breathing and also urine flu. So we need to stay on top, I'm saying it again, and ensure complete course of antibiotics are uh, completed to prevent infection. We also, also encourage the parents to report to hospital when they observe any of the following signs here. Swollen or discolored penis, redness, 
large amount of bright red bleeding and then also fever. So even if it's in hospital, because the mother is always by the bedside of the patient 24 seven, there is a need to educate her on some of these danger signs so that she can report if she happens to be the first to find it. So this is where we end our first topic and then now we'll look at cataract. So cataract is a condition in which there is crystallization of the lens and the eyes of the eyes and becomes opaque and it makes it also very difficult for light to penetrate through. And so it affects viewing because the light cannot op or, uh, penetrate through the opaque lens and hit the retina. The opacity may involve part of the lens or the total lens. So once again, the extent vary. And then cataract may be congenital or when it can be as a result of hereditary or as a result of some infection in the mother and may be acquired also from injury or some metabolic disorders like diabetes and galactosemia that may occur also as the child grows. If not treated, it may also result in blindness. How do we diagnose this? Most of the time, a cataract can easily be visualized on the outside. Looking at the person's face, you can see that the lens seem opaque or cloudy. And so, ophthalmic examination is conducted to determine the extent of this uh, opacity of the lens. And so, the child here, their eyes or the pupil looks white and may have some squint depending on the problem the child has. And then may also complain of blurred vision. Cataract is sometimes associated with fetal alcohol syndrome and Down syndrome. So when we come across such children, it's also important that we elicit this on the face or the eyes. Treatment. Diagnosis at an early age increase the probability of successful treatment. And so the damaged lens usually is removed and then a corrective lens is placed in at facial lens. And sometimes the child may use uh, glasses, external lens in the form of uh, spectacles. And so these may be intraocular lens may be placed in or external lens by use of glasses. And the nurses, nurse, we need to nurse the child from the unaffected side so that the child can see us and we can interact when we are caring for this child. Also important to establish therapeutic relationship with the mother and the child to allow them to express their concerns about visual loss. Also to show them cases or pictures or patients even on the units who might have that and have had the surgery successfully done. Also to reduce uh, injury, inflammation and promote recovery. Drugs like antibiotic, corticosteroids and anti-inflammatory eye drops are used and this must also be dropped on the inner canthus of the eye. Similarly, post-operative management also aims at preventing injury, pain and infection. So the same is done. The various corticosteroids and antibiotics and steroids are given. Ensure that the eye protector are also placed on the eye to also prevent injury. And then we also need to restrain the child from further causing injury to the affected eye after surgery. And also the unaffected eye sometimes or most of the time after surgery is also covered to also ensure that the child uh, recover fully. Also parents are informed of the signs of complication. And then the, we also need to stress the importance of follow up after the surgery is done and also the need to use sunglasses to protect the eye from ultraviolet radiations, especially in our parts of the, here in Ghana where we are always having sun. And it's also advised that if the parents can afford and there are some needs, uh, resources available, then it's good to give the child lens that is also photochromic so that when the child is in the sun, it also turns dark to protect the child's eye 
from ultraviolet radiations. And as the child grows older, and periodically as uh, the eyes are evaluated, there may be the need to change the lens to the strength required. So here I have formulated some nursing diagnosis of a child with a cataract. And these include acute pain related to trauma to the incision and increase in intraocular pressure. Risk for infection related to trauma or to surgery or the incision done. Risk for surgery related to blaring vision. Anxiety related to actual or potential vision loss. And then risk of ineffective therapeutic regimen Regime, uh, treatment management, risk of ineffective therapeutic regimen management. For these nursing diagnoses, I want you, for the purpose of an assignment, to formulate the nursing uh, outcomes and the intervention. Take time to try your hands on this and then compare among yourselves at your various discussions. This is where we end today. These references will help you to further read and understand what we have discussed.